Hello to your viewers, Stealthy Unknown here back at you with another firearms components, triggers, whatever video. Today, this is a little bit of a different video. I'm not covering any particular firearm or mechanism that exists in the real world. This model you see right here is purely proprietary. I drafted this on my own. It is loosely inspired by like a P90 or... I didn't actually really use any existing firearms for reference, I just used concepts and philosophies that I knew from previous existing models and work that I've done in the program to draft this. And the philosophy behind it was a sort of tanker's carbine or PDW, about a 10 inch barrel, 14 inch barrel, bullpup to reduce the overall length, uh, magazine fed from the bottom obviously. And another part of the philosophy was as few moving parts as possible. So we'll just start with just a firing demo just to demonstrate that it works. And it's got a staged trigger, so I can still fire single shots on automatic. And there's a spring-loaded uh, resistor behind the trigger that after that first break, the trigger contacts it, and you actually have to depress a second spring with more pressure get it to fire full auto. Uh, firearms that use staged triggers like similar to this would be P90 or the Steyr AUG. Now those use a straight floating trigger as in it doesn't rotate like this one does it instead slides back like a 1911. The problem with a trigger like that though is that they they're susceptible to a lot of additional friction and they feel mushy and janky. People tend not to like straight pull uh, bullpup triggers. So I opted to instead go with a sort of extended uh, pistol trigger of sorts. So if you've ever handled or looked at the schematic of say a Beretta 92FS M9, you'll know that, and actually this is pretty ubiquitous along among a lot of pistols is that the trigger itself rotates like so and it has a trigger bar like you see here on a trigger up on a uh, pistol it obviously be a lot shorter because the hammer would be say here compared to the pistol grip but i've extended it back which actually doesn't interfere with the way it operates it doesn't give additional friction if anything it introduces a little bit of extra weight but if it's made right, that's really not a concern. And the way this works is you have a hammer and a single sear. There are no auto sears, no secondary sears, no disconnectors. The, uh, for lack of a better way of putting it, the trigger bar itself is actually both the disconnector and the auto sear. And it depends on the position of the selector and the position of the trigger. those determine how it functions. So I'll actually go in here and we'll uh, I'll ghost these a bit so you can see everything that's going on. So you have the hammer, you have the sear, you have this tab that the trigger bar will hit when the trigger is pressed. I'll slow this down so it's a little bit more visible. What happens when I press the trigger is the bottom of it rotates back. It's fixed on this pin this pin floats is actually just an extension of the trigger bar is i guess you could say an extension of the trigger bar that's cylindrical an extrusion on the side of it fits through the top of the trigger and the result is because the trigger rotates back the trigger bar slides forward and when it does it presses forward on the tab and forces the sear out of engagement with the hammer like so now the hammer is free to drop, and when it does, it fires. And when the bolt cycles, you notice that it pushes the trigger bar down like that. That is very similar to the way a 92FS or most handguns that use a trigger bar like this would operate. The slide has a cutout or a recess in it that an extension of the trigger bar slides up into. And when the slide recoils at a camfered surface like this, inside it actually pushes 
it down. And when it does, you notice that the bottom of it, the part that once pushed on the side of the tab, now rests underneath the tab. And I have to release the trigger for it to reset in the position. It's a very reliable mechanism. The uh, length of travel and the damn it and the reset are actually fairly short. Now, what's going on with full auto is you may have noticed this angled surface right here, and what that does is when I set it to full auto is initially it'll try to fire just like on semi-auto however you notice that angled surface has done something here and function just like that primary surface right here it also wants to push that tab forward now the hammer is again free to fall onto the firing pin and when it cycles it's the timing of these two surfaces that functions like an auto sear. So while it's down, that angled surface is out of the way enough that it doesn't press the tab, but the spring pressure on the bottom rotating the uh, trigger bar up is enough with that angled surface to overcome the sear again once the bolt is in battery. So it fires once it closes. The hammer doesn't follow that bolt forward. It waits until it's in battery and it can trip that sear again. I thought this came to mind when I had been playing around with pistol mechanisms on earlier models in this program. And I had noticed, hey, you know, it just clicked. Why introduce additional sears, camming surfaces, different mechanisms? You can literally keep the same number of moving parts and still introduce additional firing functions just by manipulating the intricacies of the geometries involved. And I figured this was so clever or so innovative in this program that I figured this was worth sharing a video on all on its own. Since predominantly since my three run burst video, the, uh, the viewer base on my channel centers around trigger components i figured this would be right up the alley of the people watching my channel and that they would get a kick out of this or find some entertainment or value from it it isn't produced in real life i haven't seen a trigger that works this way everything i've seen thus far always has a second sear for full auto or some sort of a trip of some sort i figured why not cut out all the middlemen just use the existing components that exist. Now, potential issues with the legality of this. Obviously, in the U.S. at least, I can't speak for other countries because I don't know those laws, but in the U.S. at least, obviously, full auto isn't exactly illegal in the sense that you can own a registered full auto firearm but it has to be registered before a certain date. And there's obviously all sorts of legal hoops you have to jump through. You gotta get fingerprinted. You have to sign off on a background check. You have to interview a law enforcement officer, like the chief law enforcement officer of the uh, municipality or district that you're in. You can't transport that firearm across state lines without declaring it. But when it comes to the actual components, like this hammer isn't inherently a full auto hammer. There's no catches or anything for a full auto sear, nor is this sear particularly a full auto sear. Really, what I could see being considered the NFA item, that is the regulated component that would constitute possession of a machine gun if you were to own it, would be the trigger bar itself, and that's because the angled surface right here. The bolt itself actually isn't even an NFA item because it doesn't have any trips for an auto sear. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't have any of that. Instead, it's just the particular geometry involved here. 
that does the timing. Now, I can imagine if this were to make it to production, which I doubt it will, I, I do predict that somebody might see this, like some firearm manufacturer, and they might try to produce a firearm that uses a similar sort of mechanism. So obviously, this in its semi-auto configuration is ubiquitous among a lot of handguns, that sort of idea where you have a trigger bar, hammer, sear, slider bolt, and that cams it down to disconnect. That's obviously, you know, that's been done to death. So many handguns of various kinds use that kind of a mechanism. But I can imagine for commercial use, because you can't buy machine guns manufactured after 1986, there was a cutoff date. Uh, I'd imagine this would either be manufactured with this face flush like so, or it would be cut out further so that such a an angled surface couldn't be introduced. I'd imagine that the further cut would probably be the more preferable option because if you did have this material filled in, there's no there's nothing really stopping someone from taking a file to it and getting it into this shape. So I'd imagine cut back is gonna be the safe bet. Additionally I could also see that the trigger itself, or like this part of the trigger, could be construed as an NFA component because it allows that trigger to make the motion necessary for such an angled surface to actually function. Now, very certainly, the trigger bar like this in this configuration would be an NFA item, but It's up in the air whether the trigger would. To, uh, I'll add a comment onto that and say that the uh, ATF itself does not make rulings or official statements based on drawings like this one. And that is actually the uh, language they used with me when I submitted something else to them one time. I submitted something or a video of mine to uh, the ATF's fire tech department. And those are the guys that actually receive physical submissions to be reviewed for legality. So when a, a new firearm component is manufactured in the US, the uh, manufacturer will often send any components or entire firearms that might be questionable in legality to the ATF and they do physical tests on those components or firearms to make their determinations. They actually require you to submit a physical sample for them to make their determinations. They can't make any rulings based on this, but just given my predictions, this would be the NFA component. Another thing to note is you can drop the hammer and then put it on save. Something you can't do with uh, an AR-15. I thought that was kind of nifty and there's reasons to uh, keep a firearm like this. You decompress the spring, there's no uh, threat of uh, accidental discharge. There's certainly no run in the chamber if the hammer dropped and uh, nothing went bang. So there, it's the military, with firearms that they can do that with, likes to do that. You can't store an AR-15 on safe with the hammer down because when the hammer's down, the trigger's down, but not with this. Anyways, uh, that's really all I have to get into today. This was a fun gun to design. I quite like the look of it, the shape, and how I imagine it would handle. Uh, obviously, I can't really say if it'd be comfortable to shoot or if it'd be properly proportioned at all until I actually physically tested it out. But just going proportionally, I kind of attempted to make the length of pull, that is the length between the grip and the butt stock, roughly the same as an M4 with the crane stock set to the second position. The crane stock on an M4, that is the uh, stock that you can uh, pull out or push in, 
usually has six positions and on the typical six position stock I uh, overlaid you know dimensionally like the pistol grip of an AR with the butt stock over this and set it to the second position that's long enough that you have a decent length of pull good stability you get the front end of the gun out far enough that it's stable but it's not long enough that it becomes unwieldy all right that's really all i have to say now sorry for the second uh tangent i hope you enjoyed i hope this was interesting or useful to you in some way if you have any questions comments or remarks leave them in the comments below and i will respond as soon and as accurately as i can Thanks for watching.